Um, so here I am, I'm talking today about uh, seven ways, seven categories really, where virtual reality has been very surprising to, to game designers. And a lot of talks about VR uh, here at, at Casual Connect, uh, quite a few about design. Uh, I think you'll find that even though this overlaps some of what's been said before, what's interesting is that VR has so many surprising things that I think you're going to learn something new no matter what you've seen uh, already. But just to check, uh, curious if anybody here saw uh, Alex Faborg's talk at 11 AM about uh, designing for Daydream? Ah, great. OK, not, not too many. So there's, there's a bit of overlap there, but uh, most people, this will all be fresh. Um, so let me dive in a bit. Uh, I've been a professional game designer, uh, game developer, I should say. Uh, since, you know, about the time dinosaurs uh, roamed the Earth. Uh, that's given me an interesting perspective. I, I've worked with a lot of new technologies. By definition, almost everything has been a new technology over those years. And I've specifically focused a lot on games that involve story uh, and storytelling, although not exclusively. Some of them have been pure action and combat sorts of games. Um, and as a consequence, though, I worked with a lot of people, particularly filmmakers, and uh, some playwrights, some uh, novelists. And it's been very interesting for me seeing what people from other disciplines have learned. And uh, you'll see why I think that's relevant to VR. Uh, but I've been working mostly on virtual and augmented reality recently and some other game technologies and Google and talking to developers about it, as I am now. So these are only seven ways. There are probably an infinite number out there and probably a fairly large number that are significant. I'm going to start with a little introduction about why I think virtual reality is important to us from a sort of evolutionary human being perspective, and then dive into these, these seven categories that I'll define as I, I go through. Um, but the fact is, I think virtual reality, a virtual reality technology, in fact, goes way back, perhaps as far as fire in a million years. Uh, and what I really mean by that is speech itself. In fact, what I'm doing right now is telling you about my impressions, my thoughts, uh, and hopefully building images in your head. I have technology here to help me show you images as well. This is something that's not very new in our, uh, our race as well. But the fact is, we've been trying to convey those thoughts from one person's brain to another uh, through storytelling for a very, very long time. And being the kind of creatures we are, we've been looking at technological ways to do it better and better. So to go back from a million years ago, or nobody knows exactly when we invented speech, but it's quite a long time ago, to a mere 40,000 or so years ago, we had people doing cave paintings. It's certain that people were doing paintings or drawings with charcoal on much more perishable uh, areas for much longer than that. But this is not only well preserved, it also shows that even 40,000 years ago, the technologies in terms of pigments and uh, the ways that they were applied, the kind of conventions and techniques that they used were pretty sophisticated. That uh, I don't know how many of you are artists, but I know that with my extremely limited art capabilities, I couldn't make anything nearly as realistic as that. And it's hard to tell from this picture, but a lot of the cave paintings show signs that the artists we're using subtleties like the contours of the rock to uh, pick the right place to make their drawing so that it seemed almost 3D. Or in some cases, they saw these odd cases of it looked like multiple legs on animals. It didn't make any sense until they thought that when this was originally painted, it was done in torchlight. And when you look at it in flickering torchlight, it actually seems to be animating and animals seem to be moving. So we've been looking for ways to not only show pictures, but show essentially moving pictures for a very long time. To fast forward through you know, the last 40,000 years, a lot of other technologies that have come up, um, I think particularly of uh, note, is theater, which you know, in terms of modern theater, uh, a lot of the, the techniques we use now were invented by the Greeks around 3,000 years ago and refined since then. One of the interesting things that we've been seeing quite a bit of recently is, though, is, is theater where the audience is all around you and you're not even sure whether you're part of the action or not, you know, people where, where you get to be part of a wedding party, that sort of thing. The virtual reality, I think, has a lot to learn from that. And uh, I expect we're going to see a lot of people from theater entering into virtual reality storytelling in particular. But it brings it all the way up to recent computers and computer games, which, of course, 
are, are not strictly about storytelling, but have a lot of those elements. Uh, there are subtleties in there about the fact that computer games are different than all these other types in that they are about agency, about interactivity, and about the choices that you make as a human being, and not about the choices that somebody else made that they're telling you about in a story. But we in computer games have learned how to do both standard storytelling and interactivity where you become the subject of the story, and I have every reason to expect that virtual reality will continue and expand on those sorts of things. But they've all had in common that when they're invented, there are new techniques. Uh, originally, when these things first come out, they use old techniques, then they get better at it. Uh, early on, you can see in the lower left there, one of the extremely early movie cameras. They were huge, they were heavy, so they would just set it up in front of a stage and film a stage play. And that was good enough. But there were so many other techniques that they learned, even within the first decade of filmmaking, of cutting away to simultaneous action, to uh, giving close-ups of the, the characters, to in, even giving sort of a first-person point of view. Uh, been a very interesting evolution there. But to get to those seven ways, I just want to say, again, it's a convenient number. There are a lot more than this. Other people have been talking about other things that are just as important or relevant. But I also want to thank everybody who's helped me with this, both uh, our team at Google, uh, Alex, who spoke earlier, and a lot of people in the Google VR group have been putting together material. And there's quite a bit online that I would recommend that you take a look at. I'll point you to some stuff in, in particular as we go along. Uh, and also all of my fellow designers and developers at other companies who have been putting out the word about this. I think it's really critical. And having been somebody who was a developer in the early 80s when a lot of this stuff was brand new, we need to actually share it. You know, VR is very much like what we were doing way back when, you know, 35 years or so ago. So to dive into what we've got next, um, our Daydream VR headset. Uh, how many people here have heard the announcements or are familiar with what Google Daydream is about? All right, well, it's less than half of you. Let me give you a, a very quick background. I'm not doing a sales pitch, but Google doesn't actually allow me to tell other people's stories for them, so I'm going to illustrate a lot of this with Google's technology. Uh, Daydream is a new controller uh, template that we're making available to third parties so that anybody can make these, and uh, much like we did with cardboard, but with a uh, higher precision, higher performance type of virtual reality. And it comes with a controller that I'll be describing a little bit later in a controller section. Uh, and it will only work with phones that are coming out later this year and into next year from uh, many different manufacturers. We've got uh, quite a few of them signed up already. So that it won't just be one system for one company, but much like we did with cardboard, many people will be able to support it. And uh, I think that that's really an important thing in getting it out to as many people as possible. Google really wants to make VR for everybody. And this is one of our steps at improving the, the bar. Our Android N release of Android that's also coming out this fall has a lot of VR modifications that were specifically done so that it would work well with this headset. Uh, a lot of them chiefly about the pipeline of getting the data out and reading the sensors, having higher resolution sensors as a standard, so that even mobile VR can actually give an extremely high quality uh, experience. And uh, finally, before I dive into these seven ways, let me also say that if you look up Cardboard Design Lab, uh, I'm sure many of you have had Google Cardboard. It's very easy to get a Cardboard compatible viewer if you don't have it already. And the Cardboard Design Lab actually gives you some tips about how to design for VR from within VR, which I think is a great way of doing it. And I'll quote a few of them, but I'd recommend that you download it. It's free and uh, very easy to get a hold of. So first of these seven categories is physical. And by this, I mean the sort of physical way that we perceive motion in our inner ear and use our eyes and brain to synchronize that with what we see in the outer world, and all the different things that we have to do to get it right. I, and I don't even have time to go into all of them literally, but I'll hit uh, a bunch of the most important ones. The reason that you need to get this right, and uh, Alex hit this in an interesting point too, to go back again to evolution is that if you think about it, it's a little odd that we can experience a sense of um, uh, motion sickness uh, or VR sickness for that matter. And you know, why should that make us sick to our stomach? Well, if there was a, a discrepancy in our ancestors between what their inner ear was telling them about their own motion and as they were moving through and what their eyes were telling them, if they had this sort of woozy feeling that they were actually moving when they weren't moving or that they were trying to move in one direction but they seemed to be moving in another direction, 
that was probably a sign that the berries or the mushrooms that they just eaten were probably not a good idea, and getting it out of their system as fast as possible was the best reaction to that. So this is what we're fighting against uh, with certainly not all people. It, it's very much like uh, seasickness or uh, car sickness doesn't affect all people equally. Some people, it doesn't affect them at all. Some people, it affects very strongly. But if we want to get as many people using the VR as possible, we've got to get as many cues right as possible, bring down the time between your perception of motion and what you see. And uh, let me just hit on some of those cues and what we need to get right. The simplest ones are pretty obvious. I think everybody working in VR knows about this. Vergence in the sense of convergence or divergence, having two images that your eyes blend together into to one image, and doing that in perspective. So it's subtly different images. Your left eye and your right eye see something slightly different. When we combine those with lenses, it gives us a 3D perception. Seems really basic, but there's a fair amount of processing just to get all that right and to get the proper distortions into your image so that the lenses then make it look like a normal image when it's distorted back through the lenses. Another one is occlusion and size, that we're used to seeing big things or things that seem big are usually closer. Not always, and one of the ways that you can tell about whether something big is far away is if there's stuff in front of it. So that, that planet in the background, I can tell it's a planet and not a little globe you know, sitting out in front of everybody because you can see there's a spaceship in front of it and, and maybe even more importantly, there's a distant mountain range that is occluding it so it's farther away from that mountain range. And there are various other lighting cues that are giving us a sense that it's really far away. All of that seems really basic, but particularly when people put up signage in VR or interfaces, I see them ignoring a lot of these rules. And you can get all of your environment right and actually blow the sensation by putting up floating signs that don't have perspective, that occlude everything else so it tells your eye that they're really close, but they don't actually have a sense of 3D. So your eye sees them, the left and right images are identical, which means it must be far away. And your brain sees that discontinuity between the occlusion telling you it's close and the vergence telling you it's far away. And that makes you uneasy for reasons you can't detect. You have to be careful about this and all these other little things. Um, they did get distance fog right in there. This was actually something I applied to a game called Coronas Rift back in the early 80s. I think it might have been the first one that used this effect in a video game getting that sense of fog and lightning uh, towards the horizon. And parallax, which we've also used for 30 years, in that if we're moving side to side, you'd see the near ridges moving faster than the far ridges. Really basic stuff, but it is easy to get this stuff wrong, and it's more processing to do. Uh, then texture. If the texture of something doesn't change with distance or it uh, has moiré patterns or other interference, that can be a giveaway that you're in a virtual world. In the real world, we can see that the uh, area you know, in front of his feet is closer than the, the area farther back, partly from the texture of it all. And something that isn't in commercial systems, at least not that I'm aware of, but that I believe is, is probably coming fairly soon, is the ability to do focal depth. Uh, when we close one eye and move a finger in and out so that we look at it, you can actually feel uh, how your eye is changing its lens shape so that you can see it sharply no matter where it is, and everything else gets blurry, much as this uh, view of a lizard. At the moment, with most VR systems, everything is sharp, or if they do an effect like this, it is to try and draw your eye towards the lizard, but if you decide to look at the blur blurry part instead, there's a discontinuity there. But this is something that a lot of people are working on, and I think we're going to get to that point. So finally in this section, the idea is that there's a lot of steps to go from what your inner ear is sensing, from what motion detectors in a, a, a phone or a headset can detect, sending that to the CPU, it sends it to the CPU, sends it to the screen so your eye can perceive it. The trick is to get all that down to less than 20 milliseconds, hopefully significantly less. Uh, if you go longer than that, you run into trouble. There's a lot more of detail that's been written about this. If you're a programmer, I, I assume you uh, either have found this out or you, know, you should delve into it yourself. Um, on a more designerly side, immersion, uh, it's a word that has been used to, to mean several different things. In this sense, I'm talking about it as the subjective sense that VR really gives you the feeling of um, emotions being stronger in virtual reality, emotional reactions. It really was a bit surprising to me when I experienced this myself the first time. 
and I haven't seen any really good studies because VR is generally so new, at least with the quality that we're able to do it now. And I do believe, however, that there's a really strong emotional involvement within VR. Certainly, fear is something that we've seen. Any of us who've done VR, it's really easy to get scared in VR. Uh, and that makes sense that this would be a very strong thing, again, from an evolutionary standpoint. My, my friend Hal Barwood, who is a, a film director and writer, told me that when they first added surround sound to theaters so that they had speakers that were behind you, they found that they could get something like three times as many people to jump out of their seats if the same scary noise happened behind you than in front of you. And it makes sense that we're hardwired to be extra scared about that sort of thing. VR puts you into that world. It makes it seem so real all around you. Of course, fear is going to be magnified that way. But that's not all. You know, the spatial audio is actually more than just 360 degrees. You also can actually uh, find things that are above or below your, your point of view if you do it right. If you don't bother to do the processing for this sort of thing, you lose an important cue that we use in our brains to figure out what's going on around us. So this is another critical thing. This uh, lab number, by the way, is from that cardboard design lab that I mentioned. So I would recommend uh, taking a look at that for the rest of, of what's out there. Um, and happily, because it's not all about scaring people, empathy, I have found, again, my own subject subjective experience that's corroborated by a lot of other people, is that being in a VR world actually makes you feel more identification with the characters around you. Uh, I find that really interesting and surprising in a positive way. Again, I think it has something to do with theater and that I know in my own experience when I go to live theater and I'm close to the actors, there's more of that emotional sense, particularly when there are strong emotions happening between them and you're right in the room with them. And VR, of course, virtually puts you in the room with them, so it makes sense that it would work that way. I would strongly recommend our taking a look at, uh, for Spotlight Stories, Pearl. This was debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival a couple months ago. Spotlight Stories is a group of Google that is doing some really innovative research into 360-degree storytelling, and they've moved into VR recently. Pearl uh, is the first VR experience that actually has literally brought me to tears, and given the problems we already have with VR headsets getting pretty steamy and sweaty. You know, we've, we've got even more moisture uh, removal issues to deal with now. But I'd strongly recommend it. It's a, a very touching little short movie, almost like a Pixar film. Um, another thing closely related to sense of immersion is that sense of presence I alluded to, that VR makes you feel like you're actually there. Not hard to see why a virtual reality system would do that, but it's really interesting to see what kinds of things we as designers can take advantage of with that or can do wrong. Um, in just about every system that's come out there, whenever someone has made an experiment with a new type of technology, they've made the mistake of trying to over-explain what's going on. Um, we've seen this a lot of times before. I'm sure that Greek choruses were somebody saying, well, we've got actors up there showing the, the audience what's happening, but let's just have some voiceover sort of telling them what's happening too. They didn't trust that they could actually get it just from having the actors out there. Uh, there's a great thing, I, I expect a few of you are familiar with this. Uh, people know about the film Lady in the Lake, what was unusual about it, anybody? It was one of Hollywood's experiments to do first person movie making. Uh, it's a uh, Raymond Chandler mystery where you are the detective and see everything in first person for much of the, the movie. And there's a, a very hilarious uh, trailer for it that I would recommend you take a look at on YouTube that is corny in all the ways that 1940s stuff were. They try to explain you know, why you, we give you this point of view. It was a commercial flop and there was very little first person filmmaking that was done after that. But even more recently with a lot of video games, particularly when we were playing with full motion video, but even when we were doing games like um, Dungeon Master, if anybody remembers that from the 80s, you're controlling four characters. They had, I think, 15 pages in the manual devoted to the story of how you are magically controlling multiple characters, when the fact is, you just don't need to explain it. You just give it to people, let them see what's happening, and they will learn how to do it. This is something that we've seen over and over again in these transitions, and I, I may be over-explaining, over-explaining at this point, so let me move on. So, impossible cameras, one other example of this sort of thing. In, if you go, if you see a movie set in space, something like uh, Gravity, for example, you're seeing it from points of view that are impossible. You know there's nobody else out there. You know, Sandra Bullock was alone and there wasn't a cameraman floating there. They could explain why there was a film crew to get all those, those shots, but 
we've grown beyond that. We don't need that sort of thing. And that's what I think we need to start looking at with VR, of how to get past that sort of thing. Another interesting sidelight here is that people have found that VR, it can be very emotionally uh, compelling when a character there catches your eye and sees you, acknowledges that you are present in VR. I heard a great lecture by uh, somebody who worked on the, the Henry film that uh, Oculus did about how they realized they had, they had uh, made a bit of a misstep because they talked about Henry as this character who you meet who's very sad and lonely because he's alone on his birthday. And he's constantly making eye contact with you and acknowledging that you're there. So all along, it's like, well, who am I then? You know, am I useless that I don't keep you company? So they really found that they, even though they found it was a great reaction, that you felt he was really uh, connecting with you, in that particular storyline, it was probably not the most appropriate one for them to choose. OK, next I'm going to talk a little bit about interface. I'm not going to get into this in a great deal, because this is something that you have to experiment with, that over time with games, we went from first keyboards to adding mice to then game consoles with very simple controllers and then adding more buttons. Uh, we moved on more recently to touch screens, and that added a whole new vocabulary. And with all of these, it wasn't until people started to master what's good about the new controls. If you think about touch screen and some of the initial games that use like a virtual uh, uh, joystick that were just terrible, your thumb would slide off of it and you wouldn't realize it had happened. It wasn't until people started doing games like uh, Flight Control or Fruit Ninja that used the language of swiping and pinching that actually started to make uh, these touchscreen games take off. We need to do that with each virtual controller that's out there. Uh, Daydream that I mentioned before, we've carefully looked at ways to make it a very versatile controller for something that will be affordable and uh, you know, included with every Daydream headset. We've got a little clickable touch pad so that you can actually move your thumb back and forth and X and Y and press down to click on it. There's a second button that you can make do whatever you like. A third one on there is a home button that brings you back to the main uh, interface. And there's a, an inertial measurement unit, so it can work very much like a laser pointer. And in VR, it's great to be able to look around in one direction and point at something else instead of having to use gaze controls. Those are fine if that's the only one you have, but this is much more versatile. Uh, but each system, of course, has their own advantages, disadvantages. You really need to experiment with each of these. Um, this is a, a, a video that um, uh, you can find online. I actually don't have it downloaded on the, the system here. But you want to balance the customization to specific uh, controllers and headsets with the ease of porting, because as VR is spinning up and there are multiple systems out there, it'll be a while before there are huge numbers of any one system. And if you make something that takes perfect advantage of someone's controller, it won't work as well on the other ones. And so you know, it's a pretty basic thing, but it's one of those things that because VR has so many different controllers compared to, say, a, uh, a console with fairly standardized controls, we need to look out for that. So almost done here. Uh, attention is really interesting with VR because you could be looking in any direction and not necessarily where we want you to look. Um, but don't fear people's curiosity. Part of the fun of v VR is being able to be in this new environment and look anywhere you want to. Use a carrot and not a stick to tempt them and not punish them. There are a lot of ways that you can do that. Uh, in our cardboard uh, VR lab, we talk about using lighting. You know, your eye is drawn to that very bright spot here. If you're looking out into the dark, that's fine, but you're still going to be attracted to light. Motion is another thing. Uh, particle effects can be a good thing where you see little bright dots moving in a certain direction that tends to draw your eye. And there are many other conventions that I'm sure we'll find out about as we play with VR. But don't be afraid at letting people look everywhere. If you have something specific you want them to look at, tempt them to look at it and give them reason to come back, or as other systems do, uh, specifically Special Delivery is another one of those spotlight stories I mentioned. Has anyone here seen Special Delivery? Wow, I'm, I'm surprised more people haven't seen this one. Strongly recommend you look it up on YouTube. And if you've got a cardboard player, you can see it in VR, but it'll work just fine holding up your phone and looking around. This was done by Ardman Studios, who do those great Wallace and Gromit shorts and, and, and films. It's very funny, but the most important thing here is that they set up a 360 degree system that also runs in VR. And there's a storyline that you can follow, and your eye is, is brought to the storyline many times. But if you look away, it essentially, essentially pauses the main storyline. 
and you're in the middle of a courtyard, much like a Hitchcock rear window looking into the back windows of all these apartments, there are stories that play out in the other apartments that complement the main storyline and often are just sort of funny or silly as a sideline. Then when you look back at the main story, you're back on track again and it picks up again. And it's one of the best examples I've seen about how to use storytelling without you know, hitting somebody over the head and saying, no, look over here. Timing is another thing. I'm not talking so much about it as in terms of comic timing, for example, but in terms of length of experience. Um, so for example, uh, with special delivery, we have that flexible time. It can actually play out over a much longer period if you look away from the action for quite a while or shorter period if you watch it. Another thing is that some things like cardboard are really good for snackable VR. It's very easy to pop a phone into cardboard, look at something for a minute or two, but because it doesn't have a head strap, you don't hold it up for long periods, as opposed to the research we've done that shows that people with high-end VR, as with our Daydream or the other high-end systems out there, people do want long-term experiences, which is yet another reason why we've got to get all those other features just right so that they can endure and enjoy uh, VR for long periods of time. And finally, experimentation. As you've seen, I'm not providing a huge number of answers here, but things that you need to look at and questions you need to bring up, because we're at a really exciting time where nobody knows exactly what will make the first huge VR hit that everybody has to play, the one that makes people go out and buy a system just because everyone's talking about it. You know, if you imagine what's happening with Pokemon Go now, if you make a VR game that is so good that everyone has to go out and buy that system, then that would be just amazing. But we're only going to get there if we try different things. And in this, it reminds me very much of those early 80s when we just tried all sorts of crazy stuff. And a lot of it didn't work because there was nobody to tell us, no, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. And despite our background in games and all the other things that you know, we're learning about uh, you know, from our history, VR has surprised developers more than anything I've seen in all of my time working as a game developer. So try things out, and when you do learn something, share that information, bring them back to us, uh, let us know at Next Casual Connect uh, you know, in Tel Aviv or where the next one is, what you've learned and share it with other people so that we can all benefit. Because the better quality that we make all VR, the more people will want to get their VR units and get involved in it. Rather than holding back and trying to keep a competitive edge, I think if we share this information in these early days, we're going to actually improve the quality of VR very quickly and build the audience that we all need and want. So that's it for now. I'll head out to take any uh, questions or follow-up outside. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, feel free to do so. I, I'm also to, happy to take LinkedIn connections, but please do it on a, a, a computer so you can type in a note because uh, I like to have the context for that. Thank you very much. Let's all give it up for the Noah Faustine.